welcome back to our second panel of, of today. Uh, you are already seeing uh, the presentation. Uh, our next presenter, namely, will be the co-organizer of this conference, Tasha Lichen from the Institute of Ethnology in Ljubljana, and she will be talking about the state administrators as the essence of change, the case of late Hadburg Trieste. Dasha is voting. Uh, so I first instinctively wanted to thank the organizers, but it doesn't make much sense this time around. It does, however, make sense to thank all of you for just being here, despite it being a Saturday. Uh, many of you know that what led me personally to start shaping up this conference was my interest in late Habsburg Trieste. I spent lots of time in the state archives of Trieste, leafing through these seemingly very dry and uh, monotonous documents, which did offer an insight into the habitus of the local elite that I was researching. But it also gave me an opportunity to think of the employees in the state apparatus and by reading heaps of rather unrevealing paperwork, I started finding the administrator, um, policemen and sanitary inspectors and other civil servants more and more intriguing. And being a, more of an anthropologist than a historian, I started posing rather anthropological questions to these historical actors. In what follows, I will present two arguments. Firstly, um, that civil servants were not passive members of the state apparatus. In other words, they were not mere particles of a grand machine, but decision-making agents. And we heard numerous examples already throughout this conference of civil servants uh, being not being able really to follow these procedures because they were oftentimes not that uh, simple and life is more complicated than a list of actions. So I was thinking first of the commissaria attending uh, all the meetings of voluntary associations. I was researching and how they needed to decide whether or not a certain word that was said during this meeting actually um, meant something that could be politically dangerous, etc. So my first aim is to question the predictability of civil servants work. So were they really awfully rational and unaffected by the different pieces of information that came across them? Recently, and I discovered this article only recently, unfortunately, Alison Frank in her article, The Bureaucracy of Honor, painted a picture of the Habsburg consuls and they, their emotional responses to challenges. She highlighted these blurred lines between their professional and private lives. And in her words, I quote, three times spilled over their professional one. Also lower ranking officials did not function mechanically and had a hard time separating their office hours from, for instance, advocating for moral improvement, nationalisms and other tendencies of the century. And let me illustrate this by using examples from the Triestine Voluntary Association, Società Zoofila, established in 1852. Okay. Um, its members fought against animal suffering and unnecessarily killings. They were trying to use all legal means to get somewhere. They also aimed to inspire young people uh, and reward the so-called good animal owners or animal carers. Uh, part of their deal was also to scold publicly cruel owners. In broader terms, the members of the, this association advocated for progress and the moral that they found suitable. Uh, they also had their own journal and posted or published other kinds of publications that are quite a good source for getting into the mindset of the back then members. Uh, to get a, an idea of who the members were or what type of um, people they were. I included a photo of this couple that spent the la last 20 years of their lives in Trieste. So it's the British consul, Sir Richard Francis Burton and his wife, Lady Isabel Burton. In this case, although he's a very famous historical actor, I'll be um, mentioning her because she was one of the most, if not 
a certain time imp most important members of this particular association and why i'm showing this picture is that the two of them are sitting in this in one of their rooms in their villa above trieste uh, and living this very very nice life uh, but both actively are fighting for the rights of animals whereas the two of them in fact had little to no experiences with animals besides dogs and parrots and uh, occasional other exotic animals that would end up in their chambers but uh, they were very aggressively criticizing the peasants and working class that were actually relying on animals for their living um, so I'm just showing them to for you to get an idea of what typical members were like. Uh, this association had a network spanning all over the crown land. So in 1880, its infuriated representative from Volosko, a small place that's near to Abatia or Opatia, reported on the abomination, as he called it, of feeding pigs with human excrement, which was, according to the author, the source of many diseases, human diseases in this coastal area. After reading this complaint, the responsible civil servant had to make a decision to deliberate whether or not this uh, very furious author was even trustworthy, what were her motive, what was what were his motives, and uh, whether or not the case was to be inspected. And um, I found numerous examples like this when, for instance, policemen then had to decide if, for instance, a donkey or some other animal had been malnourished or was in fact ill because a veterinarian could not be called in for every single case and further even stranger examples with sanitation inspectors which uh, they have to determine when exactly a place was so foul smelling that uh, certain measures had to be introduced and when not etc so i'll return to my examples later but i want to point out that laws and regulations did offer a frame, but did not dictate the outcome. What took place on the ground was always negotiated by individuals who like to, even today, reside to the so-called private justice if needed. The unwritten and unspoken laws of the state accompanied the written law in its application. Thus, while the law conceives of all citizens being treated equally, in reality, decisions are constantly being made and in this manner occupy the space between the law and its application. What is lumped under the umbrella of bureaucratic usually connotes a routine and repetitiveness that are almost dehumanized, yet civil servants were human agents acting in the interest of the state and in the interest of their class and then their own interests, of course. All this leads to some important questions and consequently to my second argument because I was wondering then what led these agents decisions how did they decide and this question is as always connected to who they these people were um, to their individual but also their collective identifications and given that I'm not a psychologist I'll stick to the collective side of things and address the well-known albeit neglected fact that civil servants belong to the bourgeoisie um, Sure, we cannot forget the role of the aristocracy, but we're talk I'm talking mainly about the second half of the long 19th century, where when their role was really diminishing. And I'm talking about Trieste, where aristocracy did not really play a role that it played in other parts of the empire. Besides the merchants, bankers, engineers, lawyers, etc., the heterogeneous bourgeois community consisted also of civil servants. This elite social category was united by a common mentality, a cultural lifestyle that uh, many historians denote as Bürgerlichkeit. It expressed itself through a specific self-understanding, a common consciousness and acceptance of um, enlightenment values such as individuality, education, work, progress, reason, independence, etc. So I also want to address the practical terms of their lives because the bourgeoisie was united um, also by joining different sports clubs, pedagogical uh, associations, archaeological, theatrical, and various other volunteer associations. 
Many historians have pointed out that associations were in fact one of the key features of the bourgeois habitus since already the early 19th century. And uh, in addition to the press, societies were a means by which liberal, liberal citizens were able to formulate and manifest their critical social and political ideas. And in this way, they paved the way from the old regime to the new progressive society. Associational life and the liberal ideas disseminated within them were essential to civil servants, perhaps even to a greater degree, as Wolfgang Goederle, who will speak just after me, put it in one of his articles, that civil servants were, and I quote, leading group in the emergence of a civil society and the modern sense already in the first half of the 19th century, unquote. Civil servants were thus, on the one hand, part of the supposedly conservative, rather rigid state apparatus, instructed, instructed to curb the novel ideas emerging among the bourgeoisie, but on the other hand, they themselves belong to the bourgeoisie, to the same class, and were in the quest for moral and social improvement. I uh, carefully looked through the history of several social reform-oriented voluntary associations, um, especially their interactions with civil servants and overlappings with what we usually refer to as state. So I built my case predominantly on the before mentioned Società Zoofila. Then there is its peer from Ljubljana, Krajnische Tierschutzverein or Krajnsko društvo za zaštito živali. And then I looked into another Triestine association called Società Igiene, which is the Society for Hygiene. Um, this last one attempted to promote public health and hygiene, both in scientific and practical terms. And it was um, established in 1899. Its membership consisted out of pharmacists, physicists, veterinarians, doctors, engineers, but also many policemen, sanitary inspectors, local administrators, and other well-educated Triestines. And the same goes for Ljubljana's Animal Protection Society and Trieste. Namely, their membership consisted of numerous civil servants and members of the city council. Even more, many of these society's presidents, board members and honorary members came from the lines of civil servants, local and even state politicians, who all contributed immensely to the associational treasure chest. If we look at the early 1880s membership list of Società Igiene, we see that among around 280 members, there was the chief of police, Carlo or Carl Porenta, dozens of members of the city council, among them the mayor, almost all members of the local sanitation committee and 10 policemen. The situation was very similar in Società Zoofila. In 1853, its members publicly thanked Trieste's Hofrat Carlo Pascutini for his encouragement and general support, which is not necessarily surprising, but when one realizes that the same Pascutini was one of the most important and most active and even founding members of the same association, I started paying attention to these civil servants involved in the association. The members of Società Zoofila were regularly publicly thanking also heads of police for their efforts in restraining unkind animal owners. Although policemen again were in more than five decades of the association's existence, always among the members. So it was civil servants making their way into voluntary associations, but also voluntary associations regularly reaching out to these employed, to those employed in the state apparatus, be they their members or not. And let me illustrate this with further example. The regulations of societies I inspected instructed their members to turn to authorities when they saw necessary. If, um, for instance, horses involved in the public transport in Trieste and the company such as Tramvai seemed too exhausted, the local police were usually called in by the members of the Società Zoofila. Um, societies like these are also constantly pushing the local as well as state authorities to consider stricter regulations and by these they hope to by this they hope to accelerate the social reform they argued for. 
I also found cases of Suchita Zoofila turning to the city councils to take care of the dissemination of their pedagogic literature on animal care to all the local schools. Sometimes the members and the civil servants collaborated very tightly. In 1882, Zoofila's representative from Gorica, Gorizia or Gertz also, Arturo Hermanek visited stalls and stations to inspect the conditions the animals were living in there. Yet he did that jointly with the inspector for public security. So an um, association member and then a uh, member of the Publica Sicurezza, so the um, public security, I guess this is how the best way to translate it. Another way the associations for social reform kept close contact with the state apparatus and especially police was also by being notified about all the cruel animal owners. So um, if police had a close meeting with someone who was not treating their animals well and punished this person, then the Società Zofila was always notified about that, uh, also about the gravity of the deeds and the punishments received. And then the members would make these information public. So to sum up with the words of one of Zofila's presidents, uh, and I quote, it is only with the help of authorities that the association can reach its goals. One could, however, add that it is only with the help of the associations that the state would, was to reach its many goals. More concretely, the state uh, and ministries and governor's offices would finance certain associational activities, such as providing for the prizes for the best bred animals, also, some associations were of direct assistance to the police. Since 1867, the members of Zoofila, for instance, they had the authority to take in all the donkeys they thought needed help. So it was up to them to reach out to the owners there met in the streets and say, look, I'm taking away this donkey or we're taking care of the animal for, let's say, 10 days or until our veterinarian says uh, your animal is healthy again and then you'll be paying the cost and we'll returning the animal to you or we're keeping it and selling it to earn money for the the work we did uh, another thing the state offices did was they would depend on the associations and their channels to communicate the information they thought was important so they would um, make sure the association would get the new news, I don't know, on how to exterminate a certain uh, bug from flats or stuff like this. And then the instructions would be further disseminated by the channels the associations had. So I wanted to depict the double role of civil servants, but also the hopelessness of separating the state from the civil society. The lines between the two were really blurred and the civil servants were there simultaneous belonging to those Reproducing the existing system as well as arguing for social changes can be discerned as a symbol of that. And to conclude, I hope to have shed a light on how actively Habsburg civil servants were engaged in constituting their relations with others. Regardless of how uninteresting and repetitive their actions seem when one first looks at the archival data, their agency was subtly changing the broader social structure. Their power, their power steer, steered me into thinking about what led their choices, which then brought to light the known fact that they prevailingly belonged to the bourgeoisie. Along these lines, it is clear that 19th century civil servants, just like other members of the back then bourgeoisie, socialized and voluntary associations where like-minded men and increasingly also women discussed and spread their ideas. Associative sociability was connected to the era's essential trends, among them the rise of nationalisms, but many, uh, many associations nourished very serious cultural and moral objectives that were not national. The associations I was and am still looking into argued for social reforms that would in fact come to characterize the 20th century. There is little doubt in the power bourgeoisie had all the more when realizing it is impossible to separate their endeavors from the actions of civil servants and the so-called state itself, which once again opens up the questions of locating the margins of the state, the state's solidity and um, 
not least the everlasting impact of the class structure. Thank you. Thank you, Dasha, for this insightful paper and uh, for being right on time.